Hello and welcome to Livewise C-Suite reporting season coverage. I'm Ali Selby and today we're very lucky to be joined by the CEO of Washington H. Sol Patterson, Todd Barlow, for an inside look at the company's latest half yearly result as well as an outlook on what investors can expect over the coming 12 months. Thank you so much for joining us today, Todd. Thanks for having me. You just released your latest half yearly result. What numbers do you think investors need to be aware of? Well, there's three things that we focus on in our portfolio. The first is cash generation. That, that's what enables us to pay higher dividends. Our cash generation was up 7% for the half. That enabled the directors to declare a 40 cent fully franked uh, interim dividend. Uh, that's up 11% on the prior period. Uh, then we look at the growth of the portfolio and it grew 10% uh, over the previous corresponding period. So looking at that trailing 12 months, 10% growth. If you add back dividends, we actually outperformed the market by 6%, which is a very solid result. And the third objective that we have, which is not numbers based, but it's about managing risk. And, uh, and, and it was a very volatile period in the markets the last 12 months. And we did two and a half billion dollars of trading activity throughout the last six months. That's a very active period for us. Uh, so that shows that we're really actively managing risk and taking advantage of the deal flow that we're seeing. Statutory profits fell around 33% during the half. Why was that? Primarily uh, two things. Uh, New Hope and, and um, Brickworks both had very, very high results in the last couple of years. Um, in New Hope's case, that was because of high coal prices that were very, very elevated, uh, generating super profits. Uh, and in Brickworks' case, that was supported by property transactions and property development profits uh, that weren't uh, forthcoming this year. So both of those results were a little lower, but that's not to say that they weren't solid results. It was just that they were inflated in the previous years. Okay. In the result, you talked about Solpat's not believing that profits are an accurate measure of investment performance as a house. Why is that and what do you think investors should look to instead? That's right. I mean, I, we treat our portfolio in the same way that any individual would look at their own portfolio. They don't look at the, uh, the percentage uh, profit that they get from BHP or Woolworths or, or a bank. Um, all they care about is how much yield are they getting their, on their portfolio and how is the portfolio growing. And so they are the measures that we look at because that's what's important to our shareholders. Todd, you just announced an interim dividend of 40 cents per share, up 11.1% compared to the previous first half. Over the past 24 years, Solpats's ordinary and interim dividends have lifted at a compound annual growth rate of 9.6%. How sustainable is that? Yeah, it's a measure that we're incredibly proud of and one that we want to uh, replicate into the future. So we actually organised the portfolio to be able to generate the cash uh, return so that we can keep that track record alive because it's uh, something that we're very proud of. There's no other company in the ASX that has a track record of increasing dividends uh, 24 years in a row. Uh, so you know, I certainly don't want, uh, want it to be on my watch when uh, we, we have to decrease. Okay, Todd, when we last spoke in August, you told us that you were seeing quite a lot of risk in equity and debt markets. You revealed you'd taken $1.4 in equity exposure off the table. And you also warned that there could be a recession both here locally and overseas. How have your views changed over the last six months? Well, it's amazing how, how much the world's views have changed. You know, when we were speaking last year, uh, it was all about whether there would be a hard or soft landing. Uh, and then what we saw was, despite the higher interest rate environment, it wasn't uh, really having a material impact on economic activity. Uh, and we saw the, the market start to race away again. And uh, you know, thankfully, we were able to get ahead of that and, and see that market was rallying and, and deployed a lot of that capital that we had reserved back into the market. So the effect of that was that we actually were able to perform quite well, despite a very rapidly rising market. Generally, we do a lot better in poorer markets, and we saw that in the first half of last calendar year. Um, but despite you know, the market rallying last uh, six months or so, we, we actually did very well and performed about 2.5% better than the market. Okay, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. You traded $2.4 billion during the half. Where are you putting that money to work? So all over, uh, you know, all of our portfolios experienced quite a significant amount of investment activity. Uh, all of our private equity investments received new capital for growth. So we're very proud of that, the fact that we're growing our private equity portfolio in the right way. Uh, we also deployed capital to our credit portfolio, which is growing. And that's despite some of those initial positions recycling and coming back to us through repayments. The equity uh, positions, both large cap and small cap, you know, churned quite a bit and, and redeployed capital. Um, the, probably the biggest movement in the emerging companies portfolio was into NextGen, which is a uranium, uh, Canadian uranium business, uh, some, something that we believe quite strongly in. Uh, we also deployed capital into Perpetual, 
and uh, we, we did about 250 to 300 million dollars in uh, private equity investments. Okay, do you see that momentum continuing? I mean, it could. We certainly, at, at the end of the period, we had $500 million in commitments that were undrawn. Uh, so that will instantly give us a, a good runway and, and we have a very solid pipeline uh, of opportunities. But I would say that, you know, the macro environment last year forced us to be very active uh, and probably to a greater extent than what I'd expect in the future. Okay, you talked about your perpetual investment before. You just revealed that your stake is now 15%, not far from that 20% takeover threshold. If you own 15%, why wouldn't you want to own all of it at some point? Well, that was as much as we could get at the time when we saw the uh, share price was, was materially undervalued. Uh, so we, we took a stake, uh, then went to the company and said, I think that there's ways to unlock value in the business. Uh, we actually put a proposal to them um, that was rejected, but what they did do was said that they're going to undertake a strategic review uh, and see if they can uh, you know, unlock that value for themselves and, and obviously that's great for shareholders and it's great for us as a, a major shareholder so we'll be awaiting the, the outcome of that anxiously. Okay, it's kind of a move very reminiscent of what we've seen over the last, I guess, 12 to 24 months in AGL and Lion Town, companies increasing their stakes in all their positions in different companies. Why have you taken that route? Uh, it's actually pretty consistent with what we do across the board. So if you look at our strategic portfolio, it's full of uh, investments where we have between, uh, I guess, uh, TPG 12.5% is probably at the lower end in terms of percentage ownership, uh, right up to 40% uh, with New Hope, uh, or 43% with uh, Brickworks. So we have a, a range of investments where we're very happy to own uh, meaningful uh, cornerstone shareholdings. Okay, your investments in private equity and private debt have grown in value. They now make up 18% of the total portfolio. Where are you seeing the most opportunity today in private markets? Well, I mean, it, 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 you'd expect me to say this, but actually I like them all. And that's, and that's demonstrated by the fact that we've uh, allocated capital to all of them uh, just in the last six months. You know, we've been buying more swim schools uh, and we're aggregating a significant business in, in swim schools. Uh, we uh, saw our wealth business called Ironbark merge with InvestBlue, and that's now a significant uh, business in the wealth space. Um, we've been deploying capital into the agriculture space and we also bought some businesses for AMP control in the energy transition space. Just on agriculture, you have 500 million now invested in that space. Why are you feeling so bullish on the outlook for agriculture over the coming 12 or so months? Well, we think that agriculture is something that Australia does very well. It's uh, globally competitively advantaged and we also think that adding institutional capital to get the scale and investing in the capex required to uh, de-risk the business is important. Uh, we've been doing that and the latest acquisition that we did, which was quite a meaningful acquisition, was uh, you know, vertically integrating our horticultural fruit and, and produce uh, so that we now have uh, you know, pa packing facilities as well. Okay, you didn't provide forward guidance today. Why was that? Well, it, it comes back to that question around uh, the fact that we uh, don't think that uh, profit is an adequate measure of, of how we perform. You know, the only thing that really drives our performance is the market valuations of our portfolio in the future and uh, it would be a, a very brave fool to predict the valuations of, um, of the market in the future so that's something that we could never do. Okay, well thank you so much for your time today Todd. It was a pleasure as always to feature you in Livewire's content. Thank you.